Okay. Um, this is an incredible honor, and um, I'm one of these people who get choked up real easy, so <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. But I, it's one of the great honors of my life, and um, thank you very much. Now, the subject of my lecture comes out of questions that I've puzzled over for a long time. For example, why is ufology's extraterrestrial hypothesis so difficult to get a focus on when it at, at one time just looked logical and inevitable? And what is the relationship of UFO reports to other extraordinary claims that figure in massive human testimony over many centuries? Are UFOs related to these phenomena, or aren't they? And what can testimony about other fantastic encounters tell us about UFO testimony? Now, the answers, I find, not surprisingly, are bottomlessly complex and hardly suited to a talk that's supposed to last about half an hour. But perhaps I can give you some idea <coughs> of what I've concluded from a lifetime of research and reflection. And perhaps I can communicate some sense of why I now find it more useful to define myself as an anomalist as opposed to a ufologist. What I'm going to take a look at is two sets of extraordinary claims which predate the UFO phenomenon of the past decades. These aren't the only sets I could have chosen, but these happen to be two I've examined especially closely over the years. It's my conclusion that they shed some light on the vexing questions that ufologists and anomalists deal with. Writing about Scottish fairy traditions in an academic work published seven years ago, two British folklorists pleaded with no small hint of exas exasperation. It should be possible to believe one's informants without believing their explanations. Now another student of Scottish fairy traditions was the Reverend Robert Kirk, who lived between 1644 and 1692. In his classic work, The Secret Commonwealth, Kirk recorded the living lore of his parishioners and, and other local people who were certain that they lived alongside a complex otherworldly order which in many ways parodied the society of human beings. Fairies marry, play music, dance, wage war, farm, own livestock, ride horses, and have a political order ruled by a queen. This supernatural landscape overlies the natural one. Thus, visible hills, caves, bodies of water, and other natural features conceal the usually invisible race which dwells inside in what our time we would call another dimension or a parallel world. One who passes voluntarily or involuntarily into the fairy realm has crossed the boundary that divides this world from the other world. We're not talking about Tinkerbell here. For one thing, fairies in traditional lore, such as uh, the ones that, the, the, the traditions that Kirk was familiar with, don't have wings. They don't have gossamer wings. They have no wings at all. They're generally said to be short in stature, although some varieties were thought to be of human height. You didn't want to encounter them. They tended to be bad-tempered, capricious, easily offended, and they often caused trouble for people who crossed their paths. And they didn't like to hear themselves talked about, so you had to be very careful about what you were saying because they were invisible, they could be listening to your conversation. They didn't like to be called fairies, so that people invented euphemisms like good neighbors, fair folk, the gentry, the good people. Though well educated in a time when disbelief in fairy traditions was, was widespread among elites, Kirk himself held that there really was a literal, real fairy land. And it, in his analysis, it was a place that existed somewhere between the earthly realm and the angelic realm. It had elements of both. And he, he came to this conclusion not out of you know, nebulous rumors and folklore and so on, but out of the direct testimony of people that he judged credible who claimed to have had personal experience of it. It's not clear whether Kirk himself had an experience of the supernatural, but he was convinced that it was a real, genuine supernatural order. Now, Kirk remarked 
that fairies are usually encountered at twilight. Now, he meant that literally, but it's also a, a perfect metaphor of the threshold or liminal space in which the other world passes from imagination into experience, into, in other words, a, a kind of twilight zone of ambiguous epistemology, one in which our rational scientific outlook tries always to impose itself on the landscape of the irrational and the otherworldly. Testimony to fairy encounters is not hard to find. All you have to do is read one of the many books of, written by academics collecting fairy and other supernatural traditions. And you get the impression that the informants are, are sincere enough, and even the, the academic folklorists aren't inclined to accuse them of lying. Mostly they just write it down. When they get around to writing about it for their academic colleagues, the contents of popular belief and the content of, popular, of personal experience are undifferentiated. The implication is that nothing remains to be explained except the foundations in some superstition haunted past of a fantastic, scientifically baseless oral tradition. If fairies don't exist, they can't be experienced. Thus, claims to the contrary need not be addressed. But once upon a time, they actually were addressed. Academics accepted the need to actually explain the sightings. What the people in the British Isles saw, according to a theory popular in the 19th century, were real people. I mean, they really existed, but they were a race of small people, the Picts, the original inhabitants of the islands, who it was speculated had been driven into hiding in hills, caves, and mountains. Now, this was an, an extraordinary claim in itself, which died for want of evidence. And also, from its just radical disjuncture from what witnesses were actually reporting. A recent book by an academic writer proposes that fairy sightings may have been generated by encounters with individuals suffering congenital deformities. At the opposite extreme among scholarly investigators was Walter Evans Wentz, author of the famous The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, published in 1911. Evan, Evans Wentz thought that fairies and other supernatural entities were quite real, living in a parallel universe which occasionally overlaps with our own. He, he wrote, quoting, we can postulate scientifically on the showing of the data of psychical research the existence of such invisible intelligences as gods, genies, demons, all kinds of true fairies, and disembodied men, unquote. The problem with such a literal interpretation is that aside from, you know, apparently sincere testimonial claims, there's no evidence of any, any compelling kind has ever been demonstrated for the presence of a fairy realm. Beyond that, there's another major objection, which, which Kirk noted, but without probably really appreciating its significance. He, if Kirk observed that fairies dress and speak, quoting, like the people and country under which they live, unquote. Now, fairy traditions are ubiquitous in traditional societies, and this in itself is a deep mystery. But each fairy society is suited to its human neighborhood. Considered in their entirety, fairy traditions are too wildly complex, various, and fantastic to add up to a coherent paranormal geography. There's no objective fairy world, just a range of subjective ones, buttressed and sustained vexingly and deeply counterintuitively by individuals who claim direct, vivid experiences of it. Now, as many of you know, the modern UFO phenomenon begins in the summer of 1947. Now, contrary to a, an academic mythology that you see in a lot of sociological writing about the history of the UFO controversy, in the summer of 1947, nobody was looking for salvation from outer space. When people started seeing what appeared to be the new and novel flying saucers, people thought they were secret weapons, uh, some side product of atomic testing or, or just delusions. And in the first Gallup poll ever taken on the subject in August 1947, ET visitors don't even register. The consensus of opinion that UFO sightings might be related to visitors from outer space really didn't take hold in, in, in society until about uh, 